Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. The framed photograph was torn off the wall and thrown to the floor, where in a moment the thin glass protecting the old picture cracked under the weight of the man's boot. However, the photo was trampled not out of pure malice, though in principle there was enough of it in the man who had smashed the house, but simply because it had fallen under his foot. And the man didn't look where he was stepping. You'll die soon, old woman, she said through her teeth. Where are you going to buy them? Charles almost fell on the ice, sitting down on the wooden floor of the archway, and cursed foully, pushing, knocking over along with the porcelain dog figurines. Damn it. He couldn't find the money, though he knew for a fact there was some here. There must be a hateful old woman always. He knew she'd always been known to be a super uncle, so she must have some money, and he needed it badly. Don't be quiet. Drunk. And he poked and turned to the object of his long-standing hatred. Tell me where the money is, and I'll leave. I've got to go to the edge. But Nancy didn't answer. Charles knew it. Knew it out of spite. Cursed, I guess. The old woman was ready to die and clutch her pennies. Oh yes, she was always so greedy. And she didn't spare him for the sake of money. She'd ruined her own grandson. The wretch. But Nancy did not answer, and Charles did not know that she was silent now. Not out of malice, not out of greed. But because because she just couldn't understand why he was being so mean to her on this night when a long unexpected guest began to rampage through her house. Nancy simply slept a peaceful sleep, having spent another gray monotonous day of which her life now consisted. In general, in the village of Zorka she was not the only soul missing, as they call it. There were its drunks and debauchees, there were its lonely pensioners. But only Nancy was so unloved, not a quiet, lonely old lady, but exactly that unloved person who made a very strange impression on everyone. Apparently, she wasn't doing well at home. But let's hope. She is crazy, not violent. In such a way, Liu Basha liked to express herself. A saleswoman of the only grocery store. The customers usually agreed. And seeing Nancy off, who, having made some simple purchases for her pension, went away with curious glances, also thought among themselves, in some words about, for instance, whether Nancy had relatives with whom she was in quarrel or was just lonely altogether. No one really knew, but theories were being made. Nancy had come to Zork six years ago and had been strangely mysteriously withdrawn even then. The people who sold her a house on the outskirts of the city said that the passport said that the person was only 66 years old but looked 80 years old, apparently. Life has been very hard on her. After all, women, as it is known, their hardships are reflected on their faces. Retirement age allowed Nancy not to care about work, and she just lived a solitary life, a hermit. She got her pension, bought groceries, and stayed at home. Other inhabitants of Zork in the spring, of course, who little by little, and who seriously cared for their plots, planted in vegetable gardens, planted gardens, palisade. At Nancy's everything is overgrown, has become weeds, and who's hola. In the end, a delegation of neighbors gathered behind her, who demanded at least dry grass to remove. Otherwise, excuse me, it creates a fire hazardous situation. Nancy listened to them silently, standing behind the fence, and went into the house. They didn't understand. The grandmother understood what they told her, but then they saw the grass distorted. And in general, every year at least she didn't build mountains of garbage near the house. There were in Zorka, of course, and people not indifferent, who tried to help the strange neighbor. Maybe the grandmother has some grief, said Molly, 18 years old daughter of tractor driver Stepan, a young student who came from the city where she studied to be a doctor for the summer vacation. One can't live alone at all. Molly baked a cake with Nika's earth and went to visit Nancy. Look at that. He laughed when he saw it. Jacob's grandfather was a shepherd whose craft was literally hereditary. His great-great-great-grandfather was still doing it. His son-in-law, however, did not want to become a shepherd and disregarding the family heritage 
after marrying one of Jacob's three daughters, became an electrician. They say that in America they go to the new neighbors with these cases. What are you doing, Molly? The American girl got off scot-free. Molly didn't take offense, and just as she wanted. She went to Nancy's house and knocked on the gate. Nancy did not immediately look out of the window and did not immediately come to the threshold. Apparently, she hoped the stranger would go away. But Molly was at that time stubborn and spunky. So she stood and smiled and waited patiently. At last Nancy came out, but did not open the wicked gate. From afar, by the way, there were people watching that wall. Molly and Nancy were talking about something. Molly was holding out a pie. The old woman was shaking her head. Leave me alone. Suddenly Nancy shouted. I don't need nobody. And the pie ruddy of soft dough, like fluff with a sea of strawberries, sweet as honey flew to the ground window in the dust. The people watching the final looked at each other. If such a bright person as Molly could not find an approach to this Novoselka, it means that she will not take root in the village. And if she did, they would never consider her their own. And for the first time it seemed to be so. But what was the surprise of people when Molly, having come again to the village, now for winter vacation, again went to Nancy. Life teaches her nothing, said Grandpa Jacob. A, eh, such a pie will go to waste again and again. Some of the villagers became spectators and all expected a repetition of the sad scene. But suddenly Nancy opened the wicket and let Molly not only into the yard, but also into the house. It took Molly about three hours to come out of there. And naturally there were so many questions for her, but she refused to satisfy other people's curiosity. There are some people who have a difficult fate. No need to harass the girl, please. She's not a bad person. That's all we got from Molly. No interesting scandalous details, no gossip, no details. All in all, it was a disappointment. For the curious, it's been that way ever since. When Molly came to visit her father, she had to visit her unloved neighbor. She was the only one Nancy would let in. Molly came to visit with hotels and judging by the mountains, took out garbage. Each time she spared no hand, no back, putting someone else's house in order. The residents of Zori shook their heads. What a pure soul, and Molly grew up an orphan. Her mother drowned when she was 12. And since then, Molly became the head of the family because her father drank with grief. The man would sometimes go to work, swear he wouldn't take another drop in his mouth. And then he'd relapse again. And not only he, as they call it, Molly had to look out for, but also a brother James five years younger than her and a little sister Mashenka seven years younger than her. Molly planned to get a job as a doctor here in her native village. In the city she lived, of course, in a dormitory and unknown how she had time. But she worked part-time, even in the city, and sent money to her family. And without this material support, it was clear to everyone. The family would be completely destitute and would run away like that. Time flew. Molly, as she planned, returned to Zorka and became a paramedic and continued to be the head of her complicated family. A day before the night before that night, when Nancy's world after such a gray, monotonous, dreary, but still at least some quietly familiar world, turned over with the return of her grandson Molly visited her. In general, she steadily visited the old lady neighbor at least once a week. She could have gone more often. Yes, Nancy's temper had deteriorated lately, and she was reluctant to open the door. Oh, it's nice out. Molly smiled as she entered the house. It would be good to open the windows for fresh air, so she opened them, chasing out the dead, locked atmosphere. I'm not empty-handed, she smiled again, lifting the bag from the store and unloading its contents. Some of it went into the cupboards, some into the old refrigerator that Nancy had inherited from the previous owners of the house. Gingerbread, red apples and a dozen yogurts, sour cream and cottage cheese. More chicken, canned cutlets, corn, a big piece of cheese. Molly knew that Nancy was extremely frugal with her pension. The old woman's health, despite her age, was amazingly good. So she didn't have to spend much on medicine. 
Sometimes it seemed to Molly that Nancy had such potential for life. Some young people have it, that there was something deep in her psyche, or maybe in her soul, that wouldn't let her use it. Nancy's grandmother walked hard, slowly, and with the mountains knocked down, as if an unbearable load bowed to the ground. Molly did not tire of reminding her neighbor about the need to eat well, but she stubbornly bought a minimum of pasta, bread, and meat scraps, bones, and a little vegetables, potatoes, and carrots. Molly could not get money from her grandmother to buy her normal food, here and had to sometimes with the seasoning of guilt, because from her family took away to buy supplies for her, though it is, agreed and in general the other, who would have thought that cunning old woman settled down, saves, sits as strangers feed her. But Molly, who had known Nancy over the years more than anyone else, could say that the situation here was not so clear-cut. And it's not Nancy's big goal to save one million from her pension. Not at all. It's just that it's as if she once set a different goal to lead a life as quietly as possible, discreetly denying herself everything. Dressing in new clothes, as if deprivation was her mandatory punishment for some sins of her youth, to the past. Nancy, Molly had naturally taken an interest over the years, but had learned little. And yet she had learned enough to raise a thousand more questions. And if all of this became public knowledge, e the people of Jorick, it would certainly give rise to one million of the most incredible gossip stories. Here, for example, is a photo album. Sometimes they looked at it, but almost always in silence. Grandmother would just sit, looking at these pictures with her guest, running her fingers over some with arthritis scholarly fingers, and dropping only rarely a word. Among those pictures were black and white. And Molly guessed, this is a picture of the Nancy family, all dressed in the fashion of the 50s, an ordinary Soviet family. But the girls here, and they're clearly in their 70s. Nancy must be a student. There's a tall building in the background, definitely a university of some kind. And here is exactly Nancy, only older than 30 years. She is wearing a snow white dress. She is a bride. The photo was taken in a restaurant, obviously very expensive for its era. Both the people and the guests seemed to belong to the elite. Next to the groom stood another man, in appearance exactly his copy, only younger. And Molly, linking her assumptions to the words Nancy had dropped, realized that this was her husband's son, that is, her stepson. The photographs from a later time were amazing. Here Nancy had clearly been abroad. Paris, London, China, and America. Looks like they traveled a lot. And yes, Molly could have sworn at this point in her life Nancy was blossoming. She was happy, but not a single picture of her pregnant or with a toddler. Molly tried asking about Nancy's grandmother having children. But then, when she asked such a careless question, an almost scary thing happened. Nancy suddenly froze, then slammed the album shut. She threw it against the wall, and how she sobbed. She wailed that no, she was alone in the world. She was the damned soul. Don't. Don't touch her, please. Why did she have to go through this? Why did she lose everything and herself? Why didn't she just disappear? Molly was afraid then that Granny might have gone mad. But I calmed her down, gave her some heart drops, sat her down, and bit her warmly. Nancy fell into silence again. And Molly herself, almost weeping, apologized for coming in with tactless questions and promised that it wouldn't happen again. And she had kept her word. After all, she thought, apparently the old woman has no children of her own, and even if she did, they probably don't like her at all. So she lives lonely in the village. But also, of course, happy in Molly's head thoughts that maybe there are children, grandchildren, and it is necessary to find them and call them to order. To say that they have moral obligations to an elderly relative, whatever the relationship is between them. But in the end, Molly didn't. And by what could be recognized through the photo album, the oddities of the mystery at Nancy were not limited. For example, there were quite a few books in French and English in her house, from which Molly made the assumption that Nancy had had a good profession in her youth. When Molly had laid out the groceries, she went over to Nancy, 
who was sitting looking out of the window. It's nice on the river. There's a fresh breeze blowing. In the woods, by the way, all the birds have arrived. They're singing well, right? Nancy looked up at Molly with her pale blue eyes, which with age had acquired a strange, cloudy, transparent tint. She didn't answer. Molly moved around her house a bit, made sure there were clean linens in her grandmother's closet. Okay, she said in an exaggeratedly chipper and cheerful tone, because there was really nothing to be happy about. I'm gonna go get some more, and I'll come back later. Okay, okay, don't miss me. Molly couldn't imagine how Nancy hadn't gone mad from loneliness. Maybe that's what she does with her books. She sits and reads, sometimes without her glasses. By the way, Nancy had perfect eyesight at her age. On the way home, Molly, as she often did, looked at the winding silver ribbons of the river. The views in the vicinity of the Zori were mesmerizing, and more than once Molly caught herself thinking that all this beauty is so invigorating helps to distract from the anxieties of everyday life, relieves stress. In general, you don't need a therapist when you live in such a place. Her own house was getting closer, and as she approached it, Molly unconsciously slowed down. It wasn't that she didn't want to go back there, but being at home was getting harder and harder lately. In fact, Molly had nothing to reproach herself for. She did not abandon her little sister and father, did not go to the city in search of personal happiness and profit. When it was 18 and came back and helped brother James is quite big, left and went to study at vocational school, decided to become an automobile mechanic. Mashenka, on the other hand, was just finishing school this year. Molly wrinkled his nose like a toothache. Nope, there's no way. To realize her sister's dream of a fancy dress for the prom, there are simply no such means. Even if Masha would believe it, not capricious, whining, and reproachful. However, Molly and did not expect much gratitude from her relatives for the fact that they are largely used to take her care as something for granted it was already used to. But how hard it was sometimes. Sighing, Molly finally opened the door to her home. It was quiet, so her noisy, rowdy little sister was out with her friends. On their day off again, they probably went to the river from the kitchen. It is the main and large room, came the quiet grumbling of the radio. My father liked to listen to it, and for some reason he listened to it when he was drunk. Dad, have you had breakfast? I left potatoes in the pot, and there's still some baked chicken in the fridge, Molly said. She kicked off her shoes and put on her comfy slippers. Her father, Dimitri, sat at the table and looked into the glass. Him and the feces, and seemingly skimpy again, dropped Molly's tears, gritting her teeth, just as long as he didn't start remembering his mother. No, there was nothing wrong with the memories themselves, of course. But the bad thing was that after them, Dimitri usually suddenly decided to fix something in the household, and what he took on, he just broke. But there was nothing to be done. Molly had never been able to put her father to bed. Then he'd get even worse. Sighing, the girl went into her room, which she now shared with her grown sister. Molly froze in front of the mirror, staring at her reflection. What is it? Wrinkles deep on her forehead. And she wasn't even 30 yet. And in general, the complexion is something, faded hair brittle. Today must be the day, Molly thought. It's that kind of day. Everyone's in a bad mood, and she's no exception. She examined herself meticulously, then resolutely turned away. Enough. Stop picking on her appearance. There's no money to be a beauty anyway, so I'll just have to live as I am. And in general, material things, as they say, are not the main thing. Nancy. Until evening, Malenko sat at the window, a little rustling around the house and still asleep. She was particularly immersed in herself, and there were special reasons for it. She hadn't said anything about it to anyone, not even Molly, who seemed to be the only one of the whole village who had been kind to her. It was just that Nancy had received a letter a few days ago, and O knew who it was from so would have burned it in the stove. But she opened the envelope trustingly. The letter was written by Charles. Charles is her grandson. He wrote that he was back. He didn't make it there. It didn't work out. He came home and realizes that they parted in a bad way, 
that they didn't communicate much at all. But there's nowhere else to go. He has absolutely nowhere else to go. So maybe his grandmother won't refuse him. Maybe she'd take him in for a while. Nancy sighed heavily. She'd hoped he'd stay there forever. Or maybe he wouldn't find her. She would have liked that very much. The letter had been sent from the address of a neighbor who lived in the building where Nancy herself had once owned an apartment. She had sold it quickly, cheaply, and with that money. So she moved to the village. The picture of what had happened was clear. Charles, not finding her at that address, had apparently asked her neighbors to tell her where she now lived. Nancy sighed even more heavily, and it was her own fault. If she wanted to hide from everyone, she shouldn't have written to those neighbors. But they were kind, kind-hearted people, and she, as Zorka settled in, she sent them a Happy New Year card for the first year. That's how her grandson found her. Nancy's gaze darted around the house, as if somewhere in its walls among the old things could be found the answers to the questions that held her. What answer? One might say, of course, that it was impossible for him to come, but Nancy was heavy with the main thing and nearly howled with the rising feelings of beggar's stupefaction and committing guilt, because it was absolutely her fault that her grandson had grown up to be such a missing person, unable to get on with his life properly. Nancy decided that perhaps she would agree. Let him come. Maybe after all these years there's even a chance that things will get better. Of course, he can't remember everything that happened. He was too young, but she does and maybe now they'll get along better. And not right away. Nancy's grandmother noticed a note at the end of the letter saying that he, Charles, actually planned to leave after sending the letter in a few days because it was her natural kinship duty to receive him. When Nancy read the note at the end, she opened it, then closed it, and folded it carefully and put it in the envelope. There was nothing to be done about it then. Then so be it. The train would arrive at lunchtime the next day, and so Nancy expected her grandson to arrive with the evening bus. Nancy didn't go through the house and certainly didn't organize any treats. There was no energy or desire to do so. She just waited, waiting for the door to open and for him to come in. Charles knocked and entered. He simply stepped over the threshold and without saying hello froze. Nancy, breathless, stared at him. Here he was her grandson. Here he was, the last person linking her to the past, a living reminder of what she had done, how stained about her conscience her soul. And back then, when everything had just begun, she had thought herself happy. A dabbler of fate, who happens to pick the ripest and sweetest fruits from its branches, except that no one warned her that the fruit was full of sweetness and poison. Nancy was from a simple family, in which, as they say, no one grabbed stars from the sky. But from her early youth, she dreamed of a very different life. That things, cosmetics abroad, that people not just respected for some labor achievements, but also recognized its exclusivity. Her parents, by the way, laughed good-naturedly at her daughter. They also said not to create confusion. Otherwise, life would show where she belonged. But Nancy didn't listen to anyone. And when in high school it turned out that she had a great aptitude for foreign languages, she decided what she wanted to become. She realized that a brilliant command of one or two languages could open desirable doors for her. And then it was said and done. Nancy enrolled in university and studied to become a translator. Naturally, closer to receiving her diploma, the student is the most capable among her classmates. She slowly acquired the right connections and one day she was introduced to a man. His name was Mason, and he was a trader overseas, and it was a quirk of fate that he needed a translator. He needed a translator. One of Nancy's acquaintances joked that she had taken her chance like a piranha, and that she was afraid of her ambition. But again, Nancy didn't listen to anyone, and she really longed for much more than the ordinary circumstances of life were ready to offer her. Mason was unmarried when they met, he was a widower, a single father with a son already grown. And Nancy was young and sweet. She knew how to be affectionate, and soon they were married. It would seem that this was happiness. But it soon turned out that Nancy was barren. 
What a blow was that to her. Don't be upset. Her husband comforted her. We already have a child. That was technically true. There was a stepson. But here practically Nancy began to feel that fate had laughed cruelly at her. Much later, looking back, she thought that it was for the reason that she couldn't be among herself that she had started treating him and his wife so badly, who were expecting the child that was to be Nancy's first grandchild. He was named Charles. Meanwhile, the world was changing. It was the 90s. Mason, adjusting to the new reality, went into business. And at first it seemed like he was a lucky man. He was winning big contracts. His family could afford to buy a house on the south coast of France. And then the black streak began. First, Mason, his son and daughter-in-law were killed in a car accident. Charles was supposed to go with them that day. But the boy was cranky and Mason refused to take him along as punishment. They were supposed to go to an amusement park in town after some errands. Nancy was left with an eight-year-old boy in her arms and, as it soon turned out, a lot of debt. She was getting visits from the bank, and even worse, from some private individuals to whom Mason, as it turned out, owed astronomical sums. Nancy didn't know what to do, but then she found a way out. There is someone who can help her, one of the creditors addressed her and explained something strange. There is a person who can solve any problem, just absolutely any problem. But I have no money, paintings, antique furniture, sighed Nancy. It's all been described. It is usually not about such a small thing as some money of human civilization. Money is, you know, just energy, said the strange creditor and handed over a business card. Black paper with a silver color. The text on it read Master A Black and depicted two dots, which for some reason caused Nancy to make a sharp, uncomfortable, and almost painful association with the eyes of a beast glaring in the darkness. But what was there to do? She telephoned her. A secretary answered and said that Nancy could come in and Mr. A. Black would see her too. As Nancy realized, an audience with this man was terribly difficult to get. But thanks to the business card, as an individual invitation, by acquaintance everything became possible. The mysterious A. Black did not seem at first sight to be an ordinary man of simple Adam. He was a man of about 50 years old with a bald head, a potbelly, and even uneven yellowish teeth. In general, he did not look like a powerful millionaire who could own a mansion, or rather even a whole castle, where she came with her grandson. Those were the terms of the audience, but once this man began to move, to speak, it was like a flash of magnetism, of charisma, of inner pictorial power. Noah Black was a brilliant orator, a psychologist and manipulator, but Nancy did not realize this for a long time. He sympathized with her losses and said that she was left not only debts and nightmares, but also numerous business connections of her deceased husband. And that's worth a lot. I think a child should not be surprised by the business talk of adults, Noah said. When the older boy Charles entered the office, he was a pretty blonde boy with glasses. Noah introduced him as his son Hector and suggested that the children could go and play in the garden, where a table with all sorts of goodies had already been set up for them. The conversation flowed on, and much later, looking back, Nancy reflected that it was very strange, as if hypnotized. He was talking, saying he would help, that she would be all right. And she'd agreed and even cried in his office with gratitude and relief. There was a savior for her after all. Then Nancy left with Charles and a substantial amount of cash. Mr. Black said it would take him some time to address her questions and concerns. And then the truth about the price came out. It just so happened that Charles had stayed overnight at the castle several times at Mr. Black's invitation. And I'm sorry, it didn't occur to her that that was a little odd. Her reasoning was this. Mr. Black is just a very kind-hearted man. And his son has his own mini zoo, carousal, all kinds of fun. And my grandson has become his friend. So what's wrong with boys socializing more? But no matter how much Nancy wanted to distance herself from her grandson, to whom, by the way, she had no warm feelings, but she could not help noticing the changes in Charles' behavior. 
He suddenly became withdrawn, silent. He didn't eat well, and at night he woke up with nightmares. He sometimes threw tantrums, saying he would never return to Black Manor. And then, with the resignation of doom, led to the slaughter of a victim, he would go there. Nancy was getting help. True, her affairs were still bad, but Black had promised that things would be better soon. And Nancy preferred to turn a blind eye to Charles' strange visits to other people's homes. Then someday Noah said it would be good for me to get away and paid for her vacation in the Swiss Alps. And naturally, he said, the boy could and should, just absolutely should, stay with him. Don't, said Charles quietly, when she announced her plans to him. I don't want to, yes, said Nancy. And I thought you and Hitler were friends. I don't know, Charles frowned. He's protective of me. But they're taking me and the other kids anyway. That Nancy didn't understand what he meant. What other kids? Who are they? Where are they taking them? Charles, speaking gravely, as if he had to break some barrier to do so, told her that there were other children on the estate, only no one could see them, and that they were being treated there, and they teach them, they teach them weird stuff, and that some evil scientists come to them. Are you stupid? Nancy shouted at him. When Charles got to the part of the story where Mr. Black, dressed up as a black goat, beat a drum and demanded that his son strike a man tied to a stone altar with a sword. Don't you dare make that up. Noel helped us. You'd be in an orphanage and I'd be homeless if it weren't for him. You disgusting, ungrateful little boy. Shut your lying mouth and listen, you little shit. At the last words Nancy slapped Charles across the face, so hard that he fell to the carpet. Crying, the boy looked up at her and wow, that look on Nancy's face gave him a chill. I'm sorry, you've been a stepmother to my father and me nobody, but I'm a little boy and I'll obey. Suddenly he called her that word which, like a wall of ice, had been erected between them. Charles had hitherto addressed her by her first name. Her grandmother had never called her by it. Nancy didn't want to because it supposedly gave away her age, but never before had Charles mentioned that she was his father's stepmother. Nancy did go to the resort and had a wonderful time, but she tried to have a wonderful time without thinking about how her obnoxious grandson was doing. And then suddenly the police showed up at the resort and said the dreaded thing. And when Nancy opened the newspapers and turned on the TV, there was a story about it too. Turns out that Noah Black had been arrested. It turned out that he was leading some sort of all who, which included many wealthy, powerful people through mystical rituals. Noah pledged to ensure their prosperity and all success, to protect their businesses. But as the authorities said, in reality he was only a skillful manipulator and even hypnotist. He extracted money from the members of the sect and did all sorts of abominations, even involving children, from whom he seemed to want to create some perfect weapon for the future. Now Noah had been captured, his accounts frozen, and all his property seized. All in all, it became clear to Nancy that she had lost her powerful patron. What about my grandson? She asked, afraid of hearing the worst. Black intended to poison him, one of the detectives said. As well as his own son, a second detective added. Nancy was told that Charles was now in hospital, his life no longer in danger. His health, on the other hand, Doctors gave predictions that the boy would continue to have partial amnesia due to the substance he had taken. About the last few months he had been at Black Manor and that he would have heart, liver or rubber band problems for life. In short, Charles had become, as the saying goes, without five minutes an invalid. Nancy was in shock and she was also afraid of accusations because her grandson suspected something, he told such things, and she ignored him. And so Nancy was greatly relieved when she learned that Charles had indeed forgotten everything. What did he remember? Well, he had only spoken on the subject of his stay on the estate to the police, and he had refused to talk to her. In fact, he'd been cold and distant with her. But he did seem to be recovering from what had happened. Nancy had lost everything, and she realized it was time to go back. Leave France. Her own parents had died by this time 
and all she had left was their apartment in an old brick nine-story building. Nancy simply had no idea how to live now, or rather survive, when she had lost everything she was used to, and when she had a grandson in her arms, to whom she recognized with surprise, and even some disgust at herself, she still felt nothing, even felt sorry for the kid, purely humanly. But there were no warm kindred feelings. But then it suddenly turned out that Mason had some relatives in Russia, and his son's wife had relatives. And so they asked if Nancy would agree to give Jenka to one of them for upbringing. Nancy gladly agreed. Let them take it. She'd done enough already. And at the same time, as it was still bitter to realize, she had broken the life of a child. The relatives, by the way, knew next to nothing about what had happened. Nancy imagined that Charles had not fallen victim to the sectarians, that he was all right, and the boy himself kept silent about everything. Years passed. Nancy tried to lead a normal life. She worked a little as a translator, a French tutor, and it was strange. But it was as if Black's curse had come true. I can assure you that the adepts who left him will be eternally unsuccessful. Nancy, barely scraping together enough money to live a more or less bearable life. Personal life did not add up, and with each passing year strengthened the feeling that there, in France, she left not only her conscience. After all, she, in fact, closed her eyes to everything that was happening, but also a part of her soul. And now what? She is forever damned. Time flew by with scant tidings. Nancy was learning that Charles was not living well. He was a two-bit bully. He was said to have become mentally retarded in general. Then he sort of pulled through and went to technical school to become a builder. Then he dropped out of school and got drunk. Then he was working somewhere and leaving home. There were other rumors about Charles growing up unloved aggressive, not getting along with people. Nancy tried to keep from herself the idea that it was because of her that he had become like that. After all, we all know how hard childhood traumas can be to deal with. Sometimes, by the way, Charles wrote her letters or even called her, congratulating her on holidays, and it was eerily strange, because he had never spoken a single word about what had happened in his childhood, and Nancy naturally did not endeavor to remind him of it. The flight was in Rome. At some point, Nancy was told something startling. Charles had been lucky enough to get a job abroad. He'd gone to France as a crop picker. But soon the sad news came from there. Charles almost went to prison in France because it seems he had done something to annoy his employer. And now he was back and for some reason not with her. Nancy supposed that after all the past, Charles had probably been turned away by acquaintances and relatives. Still, it was unclear why he had decided to visit her, but it was also hard for Nancy to think. She had been adrift for the last few years, and now more than ever she felt guilty about her grandson, and felt she had no right to refuse him. Really, it wouldn't do her any harm if he repaid her a little, and also maybe will feel better at heart, and maybe her hospitality would count for something in the next world. And so Charles sat opposite his grandmother at the table. They had dinner, a silent dinner. And before that, of course, they had a little talk over tea. Charles said that, yes, he had made a mistake in France, but he wanted to start again. He was thinking of starting a business, his own. His father had one, and he was successful. So why shouldn't he? Your father's business ended badly, Nancy said. I didn't really expect her to be so harsh herself. But she said it. Then she put her grandson on the sofa and went to bed. Nancy called Charles to her about an hour later, after they had gone to bed, and sat down on the sofa. He lay down with his clothes on. By the way, are you asleep? I'm awake. Did you wake me? Nancy answered quietly. What do you want? I need money. Charles said muffled. And you've always been thrifty, say, have you saved up? Nancy pressed her lips together and turned her back to the wall. Oh, she did not like this conversation. What more could a man want? After you've taken him in? I have no money, she said, and she was on fire. Maybe sleep will come sooner. And you sleep, grandson, 
Stay three days, as agreed, and then. Granson in pitch darkness only slightly diluted by the light of the moon outside the window. Charles' voice sounded somehow like the hiss of a snake. Granson, do you have the right to call me Granson? Oh, old girl, you've learned nothing from life. Nancy, I heard Charles get up and walk around the house. Have you been drinking? Quietly asked the old woman, smelling the thick odor of alcohol. She had always been sensitive to such things. She never kept anything alcoholic at home, by the way. What's it to you? Mumbled Charles, who for some reason Gromico paid with a towel, a cupboard. He had indeed been drinking. The bottle was hidden in his traveling bag, and he emptied it secretly when he went to bed. It was already hard to sleep without it lately. Nancy hoped her grandson would calm down. She had honestly told him there was no money. Yeah, there wasn't much in savings. That's just the way it was. She was saving for her funeral. But Charles wouldn't settle down. And as Nancy kept quiet about where he kept the money, he got angrier and angrier. You'll die soon, old girl through gritted teeth. Where are you going to buy it? At some point, Nancy got out of bed and walked over to Charles and gently touched him on the shoulder. Granson, wake up. I don't have what you're looking for. Look at me. Do I live like a rich man? No money? No. I'm sorry, Granson. Tears were rolling from the old woman's eyes. I let you down badly once. But now, now you've come to me. You came to me. And that means we're your kin, the closest people. I'm your man. So why are you doing this, Charles? Jaws. Close the old one, Charles. Throws off his hand in disgust. You think I've forgotten everything. You think I don't remember you selling me out, just so you could get money. Nancy staggered and collapsed to the floor, not because he'd shouted, but because her legs were suddenly weak. Charles threw her backwards with his words. Do you know what it was like for me? No, you never asked me, never once asked me what I was like because you never cared about me. And what do I expect from you? He grinned bitterly and angrily at the same time. I'm not your kin. Why are you apologizing now? You know, Charles looked at me with wild eyes. You could hardly understand his speech. What happened to me? You don't talk, old girl. You don't have any money, do you? Well, nothing. It's nothing. I'm telling you now how they made me talk about everything they wanted. What are you talking about, Granson? Nancy looked at Charles with eyes widened with horror. She was suddenly very frightened, and she thought of, oh, well, let him have those pennies. What have you saved up? Except that right now Nancy could not remember where she had kept them. Wiped it out of her memory, knocked it out. Out of fear, I suppose, she thought. Charles, meanwhile, without listening to her weak protests and sobs, grabbed her by the scruff of the neck and dragged her into the yard. He knew what he had to do. The sun was rising over Zorka. Molly reluctantly opened her eyes. She used to love mornings, but now she didn't, because every morning it's new worries, problems you have to solve. There's no work to do again. In principle, Molly has never regretted that she chose the path of a doctor. But it's just that she is so tired lately, who has been working for a year without vacation. That is purely formally on vacation when on vacation, but there was no time for herself. All the cases and worries absorbed. Having overcome the temptation to lie down for another five minutes, Molly got up, shot the bed, went to Poe, brushed her teeth and washed her face. Dad, as usual, fell asleep right on the kitchen floor. As of late, Molly had stopped carrying him on her back to bed. It's just a bad back and no thanks. Then Molly's little sister peeked in on her. She was fast asleep. That's Sonia, Molly sighed. Her sister liked to stay up late surfing the internet, and unless she had to go to school, she'd get up in the afternoon. With a sigh, Molly stood at the stove. I cooked breakfast for myself and my relatives. Of course, I couldn't leave them hungry. Then she started to pack. She had to go to work. Hello, lion cub, her grandfather Jacob greeted her. The fence of his property and adjoined to Molly's yard. What do you think of him? About who? 
The girl did not understand the great grandson Nancy. Does she have a grandson? Molly was surprised. Otherwise, with great pleasure from his own person, who was the first to know everything, nodded Jacob. In the evening, then, late. I was coming home from the pasture. Then my Merca the goat, you see, went to the night grazing unauthorized. But I was looking for her, bringing her home. And I saw a man standing at the Nancy gate, just like a criminal. And I stopped and asked him, who are you? And he says to me, what do you mean? He's her grandson. But that's just the way it is. This came as a shock to Molly because Nancy had never said a word about such a relative before. Molly sighed before going to work. Now she had to visit Nancy's grandmother, Nancy. Molly called out to her neighbor to stand outside the gate for the umpteenth time. No, in general, it happened that she was silent and stayed at home, not giving, as they say, signs of existence. But right now something Molly did not give rest. So, sighing, she tried to push. The wicked door, as always, was unlocked on the hook. It had been a long time since Nancy had stopped locking the yard, said there was nothing to steal in the yard anyway. Grandma Nancy, are you home? It's Molly. The girl knocked on the window and peered through the glass and curtains and immediately frowned. The sun was shining so you couldn't see very well, but it looked like a terrible mess inside. Nancy is Molly. She walked around the house, climbed up on the porch, and knocked firmly on the door. If her grandson had come to visit, then at least he should open the door. And then Molly noticed that the front door was unlocked. And that was strange, because Nancy was used to closing it with a bad feeling. Molly pushed the door open and stepped into the hall. The distinctive odor of booze immediately hit her nose. His Molly over the years, while she struggled fruitlessly with alcoholism, she had learned to recognize her father instantly. After a moment, the source of the odor was revealed. The man sprawled on the floor. Molly, eyes rounded. He made such a mess in here. He turned everything upside down, broke dishes, threw photos and things. She was seething with muffled irritation. She'd known such rowdies. In fact, five years ago, when my father had gotten drunk, he'd gotten violent. He'd only recently started acting differently. Drunk. He'd get quiet and only occasionally get violent. But it wasn't the state of the house that worried Molly most. It was the absence of Nancy's grandmother. Hey you, leaning over, she poked the stranger in the shoulder with her palm. And waking up, where's Grandma Nancy? But the man didn't wake up, only scratched God some more and stiffened even more furtively, letting out a string of saliva from his mouth. Disgusting. Molly expressed her opinion aloud and walked briskly through the house. It was small, there was nowhere to hide. And why would a monkey hide? Unless it was a drunken grandson. Why did you let him in? Molly sighed. She had already looked in the closet just in case, and even in the cellar. But the gatehouse was nowhere to be found. Sighing even more heavily, Molly went out into the yard and started calling the old woman again. What's the matter? Jacob looked out from the fence leading to the abandoned vegetable garden. Molly summarized the situation as follows. Maybe it was singing in the barn. Jacob scratched the back of his head. When I was a kid and my father was drinking in the barn, I saved myself and my mother. I remember, all shut up and sit quiet as mice. I never found it. Maybe, replied Molly and walked towards the barn. It was basically an abandoned outhouse, ready to collapse into boards and rubble at any moment. Entering the cool gloom of the barn, Molly looked around confused. Where would an elderly person hide in here? She was about to go out, but then she heard a strange sound. Molly froze and listened. Was it just me? But then the quiet sound came again. It was an agony-filled moan. It was coming from the side and muffled, as if from behind a barrier. Grandma Nancy. Alina called with a hysterical note in her voice. Oh, how she did not like everything that was happening. Molly looked around, not realizing where the sound was coming from, and that her gaze fell on a low chest, or rather a box. It wasn't very big at all. And it was piled with all sorts of junk. 
and though it was so creepy, Molly could have sworn it was where the sound was coming from. You found it somehow. Jacob looked into the shed and explained I was trespassing on her garden. Trespassing, so to speak. Grandpa Jacob Molly, almost crying, poked her finger in the direction of the box. There oh, you're aghast. Exhaled Jacob as the junk from the drawer was thrown off and the lid was flung open. Molly, on the other hand, just shrieked in horror because they're from the hook. So much so that it seemed to be halved in size. There lay Nancy's grandmother, but she was alive. Pale blue eyes and climbing over to the unwanted rescuers frantically praying, disbelieving. Slowly, without haste, she was carefully dragged outside. The old woman's arms and legs clearly caught barely chased, after hours in cramped quarters, but she didn't cry out in pain, only a body scream. Quietly does sigh often and Marguerite. Nancy's grandmother is sweet, but it's almost all right now, Molly said to her, and she herself was almost crying too, and she was holding on solely because she had awakened in her all the skills of a paramedic, suitable for a particular situation. And so, naturally, it was necessary not to cry, but to help the person. Ambulance. Call an ambulance. Molly threw to Grandpa Jacob. I have a phone, but I don't carry it with me, he replied guiltily. It's at home. Molly began to look for it. It should be here in her purse, but she must have forgotten it too. She smacked herself on the forehead, remembering that she had indeed forgotten it on the kitchen table when she had been watching an entertainment video with funny kittens over tea and sandwiches, I dashed across the yard to the gate, and just a minute before, an expensive black luxury SUV with tinted windows had pulled up to the gate of the poorest Grandma Nancy's house in the village, and Molly, as it happened, literally ran into one of the two people who got out of it. Oops, took a chance, and because she was all on edge and was in a hurry, running, she almost fell. But she was picked up by strong arms and held upright. Molly, instinctively resting her palms on the man's broad chest, hidden under a black leather braid, dropped her gaze. And a little later, looking back, she never realized what it was. But it was a state that fit the description of drowning in someone else's eyes. The stranger's eyes were brown, deep, and piercing. It was like he was looking straight into your soul. He was about 30 years old, with strong, sharp, masculine features, a nose with a slight corbenco, black to the middle of the neck, curly hair, bronze golden skin. He smelled some perfume reminiscent of leathery wood, and something pleasant. He closed a gentle embrace before she would have said let go, and a slight smile touched his lips, but his gaze was completely serious and even stern. I'm still Nancy. This is her house after all. She, Molly, almost gasped at this contrast as fear, anger, and panic returned after the singing relaxation in his hands. Nancy's grandmother is in trouble. We need to call an ambulance. Do you have a phone? The girl blurted out. What's wrong? The stranger's tone. And he changed all by himself. Now it was a man of action to whom you could entrust all your troubles and problems not doubting that he would solve them masterfully. Grandpa Jacob Molly flew back into the yard. The stranger and his shaven-headed companion entered behind her, closeted in a business suit. Breathing heavily, the old man replied, squatting beside the laid-back Nancy. Molly, confused, explained that there was no need to wait for an ambulance. This man is taking them to the hospital now. Who is it? Jacob asked with a squint. He considered himself a broad-minded man, but somehow he could not imagine that Nancy had any such acquaintances, and besides, he didn't like the curly-haired brunette very much. I am an old acquaintance of Nancy, answered the strange stranger in Russian, but with a strong accent, from which Grandpa Jacob realized that he was a foreigner, probably from somewhere in Europe, and realized Grandpa Jacob this because in his youth he was a long-distance sailor and saw the whole world. What are you talking about? Molly waved his hands. Hurry up. The mysterious brunette picked up the old woman in his arms gently, carefully and carried her to the car. 
Get in the back seat with her. He commanded Molly, and she, nodding, was the first to get into the car. The two men got in front, and the car started. It drove quickly down the road from the village to the district center, where there was a hospital. Jacob remained standing outside the gate. He scratched the back of his head, hummed, and spat on the ground. So much for the story. And then he walked. No, almost ran to the neighbors. There, already peering out from the fence across the street to tell him what had happened, and the fact that Nancy's grandmother didn't get into the box by herself and somewhere nearby. So there must be a bad person who did this to her. Jacob let it all go completely unnoticed. It was only when the neighbors, the excited flock he was telling everything to, asked him who was this subhuman. What did Nancy's grandmother hurt him? It was only then that he remembered what it must be. In general, that the first thing to ask is her grandson. When are we going to you? exclaimed Andre. Tough guy. The son from them. And the neighbors. We must catch him. And make him answer let's go. Another of the neighbors supported him. And the men rushed to the Nancy house. There they found a mess. Same smell of booze. They didn't find Charles. He'd vanished. Charles decided to teach the old woman a lesson that night and did what he did. He went back to the house and took another bottle out of his bag and started drinking. Ha! Let the cunt know how he felt. Charles thought that in half an hour he would go and get his grandmother out of the box or she would die there. He thought he'd get her out and then she'd tell him where she kept the money. Maybe she wouldn't. Fuck her, at least tell him about her. Let the bitch suffer. She's been riding on someone else's coattails all her life. Charles greedily gulped down the heady drink sitting on the floor. How he hated his life. And whose fault was that? Nancy, she thought he'd forgotten everything. Everyone thought he'd forgotten everything. But he wasn't. Not at all. Charles knew what had happened to him. And it was carved into his brain, burned into his memory with a hot iron. And it would haunt him for the rest of his life. He remembered, he remembered begging his grandmother not to give him to those people. But she laughed, called him a spoiled naughty boy, and took him there. And what could he, a little boy, do? He couldn't go to the French police. No, that's what he wanted to do at first. But Mr. Black and his henchmen explained to their little victim, very lucidly, that they had a lot of money and even more connections, and no one would believe him and for causing them trouble, he would be punished in such a way. And to be smart, he'd even been shown once what punishment was for those who disobeyed Mr. Black. But the doctors were right about something. Many of the details of his nightmares at the manor had indeed evaporated from Charles's memory. But he still remembered too much. He remembered the pills he and Hector had been forced to take. Why? Well, they were told it was for the mind. He remembered how they and other children were taken into a dark room and putting something on their heads, forced to watch strange movies with no plot and a lot of pictures and short scenes. He remembered being made to repeat aloud some numbers and being shown strange black and white blotches. They were told, looking at them, to name the first thing that came into their heads later. After such a study, Mr. Black, as little Charles understood then, explained to each of the boys that it was all part of a big project and they would become real stars, heroes, and celebrities if they went through it to the end. After these sessions, which were conducted by some people in white coats, the kids were fed hearty, delicious gifts and then let go home. Why is he doing all this? Charles asked Hector once when the boys, walking in the garden, stopped by the pond in rows. Does he really want to save the world? No, answered Hector. He wants to save himself. I feel sick, Charles admitted. I don't want to watch or listen to anything anymore. You are weak. Hector looked at him very carefully. You shouldn't be like that. You're small. You don't understand anything yet. But it's science. I don't need this science, Charles exclaimed, and kicked him with his foot. I don't want it. Good. Hector smiled and patted his buddy on the shoulder. I'll talk to your father so he won't torture you too much. And that was surprising. But after that conversation, Charles had indeed been treated a little more gently, 
but he was still scared and uncomfortable and disgusted. Charles remembered something else. What had happened shortly before it was all over, Mr. Black's estate, the police had broken in. Charles thought then, by the way, that perhaps he hadn't been able to bribe everyone. And he would have been glad. But he hardly had the strength to rejoice anymore. He was completely exhausted by this strange science. And just before the day of his release, Mr. Black gathered his guests. There was a big reception at the estate. And there were children. Not all of them, but just a few, including Charles. Then, when the reception was over for the night, almost all the guests left. Those who remained, however, dressed in black scarlet robes and went down to the basement. Oh, how Charles dreaded this place. He had been told by the other boys that it was a veritable medieval catacomb, haunted by reanimated skeletons, giant rats, and ghosts. Charles remembered the events of that night in fragments. The flames of hundreds, maybe one thousand candles burned. The walls of the dungeon echo with the hum of voices singing in a foreign language, and Charles knows it's Latin. A stone altar, a statue of something. A creature, it looks like a goat and a man at the same time. He remembered being held by the shoulders and told to look and fear nothing. He remembered Mr. Black announcing that of all the students his son was the best Hector, handing him a weapon and telling him to walk up to the altar and punish the man who had plotted to betray his father. No, don't do it, whispered Charles, whose heart was just churning. If Hector obeyed the order, he would break, something in him would change forever, and he would lose the friend he had made in this strange and frightening place, and then he can't take it all. Charles suddenly burst out and rushed into one of the dark corridors. He ran and cried, and then he tripped and fell. He lay down on the cold, damp stone, and roared heartily. He didn't care if he was punished. What the proof in the darkness, what they would whip him with the whip. He did not care anymore, but he was only carried out of the dungeon and given some bitter herbal tea, after which he fell into a deep sleep. The next morning everyone behaved as if nothing had happened. Charles had breakfast brought to his room. As usual, scones with jam, whipped cream, honey dippings, delicious wheat porridge, and orange juice. Hector looked in and told him that they had put a new swing in the garden and that he was waiting for him there. All in all, it seemed as if nothing had happened yesterday. Only Charles felt as if he had a spring inside him that had been compressed to the limit and was about to spread. And so he didn't eat breakfast, sneaking through the corridors of the house to Mr. Black's study. Charles realized perfectly well that he was just a boy, and he was not up to the task of dealing with this powerful evil. But he also knew there was something he could do. And so he did, gently, as if it could bite him. He opened the silver box that stood on the master's desk. There, on a scarlet velvet backing, lay a ring of black silver with a fancy relief pattern. Charles had taken it by the sea into his life. He imagined what they would do to him if they caught him in the act. But no one entered the study suddenly. Charles closed the box and tucked the handkerchief into his pocket. He was young, but he liked to read detective books for children and had learned about such things as fingerprints. So he opened the door to the study and the box with a linen handkerchief. It looked like the ring was in his father's pocket. Charles jumped out through the open door onto the veranda and down into the garden. He looked around and breathed a sigh of relief. No one seemed to have seen him. In the garden, Charles went to the clean old oak tree and there dropped the ring into the confusedly deep and unpleasant looking hole. Done. And then Charles sprinted to the swing and he and Mason played gloriously until lunchtime. And then men burst into the manor house and it was as if all was over. Mr. Black was arrested and the boys, including Charles, were released. Later, while he was in the clinic, he asked a detective, what about Hector? He's fine. He said the boy was fine. He's been handed over to his father's distant relatives, who will take care of him now. But no, the boys can't see each other because each of them is an important witness in this whole giant nightmare case, and so they must be separated for their own safety. And then, 
Then Charles was talked to by detectives, psychologists, and he felt utterly useless because Charles himself could remember so little. He suspected that the disappearance of clear memories, such as the faces of Mr. Black's guests, had something to do with that bitter herbal tea. Then his grandmother had taken him away, and he had submitted. What else could he do? Charles was in a strangely devastating state of indifference, and he somehow didn't care where he was or what was happening to him. Back with his grandmother, then life with a new family. And oh, it wasn't a good life. No, Charles didn't mean to be a naughty boy on purpose. He just felt like an outsider and spoiled. He couldn't help how often he had mood swings and punishing outbursts of anger in which he could start smashing everything around him. Time flew by. Charles grew up, but it was as if he did not live, but lived the time allotted in this world, not feeling the very taste of life. He had no idea what he wanted to do in life. It didn't matter. He only realized that he had to do something to earn money, because without it he would be completely lost. He tried to start a relationship with the opposite sex, because as everyone around him said, it was the right thing to do. But it didn't work out. He felt nothing for these women, and they left him easily. You seem like a good man, the last of them Lisa told him. But you're like an empty person inside. Is there something keeping you from living? Sort yourself out and be happy. Only Charles didn't understand. How do you figure it out? He didn't have any friends either, just acquaintances, but they weren't very nice. And even sometimes they left him too, saying that it was physically hard to be near him. You have bad energy, said one of the friends who left. Must be the weight of the past weighing you down, huh? You need to figure it out and let it go. And time flew by, and Charles never really got anywhere. And then things got worse in his life than ever. And it all started with the fact that in the place where he worked, on packing all sorts of household chemicals, the men started talking about the fact that abroad in the season you can earn good money as a harvester. The main thing is to be in good health and no bad habits or lines. Charles, come with me, said to him one man. His name was Serti. There's an ad for olive picking in France, but it's a bit scary to go alone, you know. Charles thought for a moment. France. That's where it all happened. And then something inside him just clicked. And he remembered that while his adoptive parents were dragging him to psychologists and psychiatrists, one of them had given the advice that sometimes it helps to return to the place where the experience was received to get rid of traumatic common experiences. So Charles agreed, and a few months later, together with Sergei, they traveled by bus to France, because air travel was too expensive, and as if there was an elaborate mockery of fate in it all. But it turned out that the farmland where they were to work was not far from where Mr. Black's estate was located. Why are you so gloomy? Sergi asked him one day. It's like I've come to hell. Laughter. Say, friend, let's go out. Let's have some fun. Let's meet a French woman. But the only thing Charles met was alcohol. It was in France that he first drank just a glass of red at dinner. But after two weeks, Charles was guzzling alcohol in such a way that he was directly hinted a little more and would be kicked out. Not a penny would not pay, and they would make him pay fines. But he didn't care. Charles lost sleep and peace. Memories, buried, seemed to be bursting out. Insistent noses were prodding. And one night Charles, having had a drink, tentatively set out for Black's estate. He didn't know himself, why he had to go there. There was just such a need that he was unable to resist. Charles already knew that no one had lived in the manor for many years, but it must have been guarded, but apparently it was poorly guarded because Charles found a hole in the fence and entered the garden. His feet carried him. He reached that very oak tree, not noticing how his fingers were scraped, splinters planted in them. He climbed into the crevices, but behind the ring the ring glittered dimly in the ghostly light peeking out from behind the clouds and the moon. Charles slipped it into his pockets and made his way out of the garden as well. He returned on foot to the farmer's property. 
He quietly made his way to the dormitory house where the laborers lived and went to bed. He did get fired, by the way, but they paid him a little. It was Sir Guy Po who made the trouble, and Charles left France. He had the ring with him. And it was strange as hell, but it seemed to be getting easier now, and at the same time it was getting worse. The memories were more painful than ever. Charles, back home, had gone to visit his foster parents and had gotten so drunk that he had gotten into a fight with his foster father. He left home, spent the night at some distant acquaintances, and then literally found himself on the street. Where to go? The only way out was to the homeless, because there was no more strength to live like that. When there was no strength and everything was like that. In a fog. But his foster parents forgave him, found him and dragged him by force to their house. Then to sleep. They fed him, persuaded Charles to code him. And he agreed. We decided to do it through hypnosis. Is that your decision? The doctor asked Charles sternly. You must realize the seriousness of this choice and the probable consequences of what can happen if you snapped and drink alcohol. Come on already, sighed Charles. I know all that, but I can't take it anymore. It's like I'm not alive. The hypnosis session took place. A very strange patient, the hypnotist later said thoughtfully to his fellow assistant. It's as if his mind has been tampered with before, although he claims it never happened. It's a very strange case. After being quoted, Charles seemed to get better. But he also realized he was definitely a stranger to the people who raised him. Now Charles just wanted to leave soon and start his own separate life. But he also realized he needed to meet someone, his grandmother. In general, he wanted to really stay with her for a couple of days and talk about everything quietly, as they say, and then move on, get a job as long as they helped with housing, and then whatever life throws at you. But something went wrong on the train. It was that Charles had a very persistent fellow traveler. Don't you respect me? He asked, drinking his eyes and pushing Charles a shot glass. I've been quoted by a hypnotist, writing. Shook his head at the interlocutor. I was quoted too. So, do you know? No. Charles looked at the alcohol and felt the urge to knock back a shot. There seemed to be a fire blazing right from the inside, and he had to douse it right away. His traveling companion told him that he was also copied by his ex-wife, but he was a free man, so he drank and lived better. It was hard to agree with him. He looked wrinkled and obviously sick, but Charles suddenly decided maybe a couple of drops would do the trick. And then, he's got that willpower of hers, He'd just have a drink to get acquainted, and that'd be it. And it was on. The traveler got off at one of the stations, and Charles stayed and bought more alcohol. His head was buzzing, humming, and spinning with such thoughts, angry and offensive at the same time. Arriving at Nancy's, Charles no longer wanted to have a calm and heart-to-heart -heart talk. He could barely keep himself from saying to the old woman's face everything he thought about how she had ruined his life. And then Charles suddenly thought that his grandmother must have money. Couldn't help but save up, because she'd always been so greedy. And there it was. And she didn't spare her grandson. Sold him, in fact. Then Charles drank some more, and it all went completely to his head. How much he hated Nancy. He was angry that she wouldn't tell him where the money was. So then he decided to teach her a lesson. Then he really wanted to let her out, but then he fell asleep unnoticed. In the morning, Charles slowly began to come to his senses as he was being shaken and scolded by some strange damsel. She was so beautiful. Just looking at her made him feel so unbearably ashamed of everything he had done. Then she left. Charles, when he realized that it had long since dawned and remembered where he had left Nancy, was horrified, jumped up, wanted to run and save her, but suddenly saw a car outside the gate, and then people came out of it. And yes, it was very strange, but only Charles, looking out the window, suddenly clearly recognized the face of that man with black hair. And even though it had been so many years, he recognized him. It was him. Charles, how had fear clung to the floor. No, 
The feeling that announced it was completely different. It was primal terror, and somehow also the realization that if this man knew he was here, his life would never be the same again. And then Charles saw the man carrying his grandmother in his arms, and he wanted to rush to them, but he couldn't. Instead, when he realized that everyone had left, he quietly grabbed his things, left the house, and rushed away from the village. In the hospital, Molly did not leave Nancy's grandmother as far as possible. The doctor who was treating the elderly patient even had to shout at Molly, saying that her fussing only prevented him from doing his work. Excuse me, Molly obediently went to the far end of the corridor, where there were free seats for visitors, and nosed down on the metal table. Don't worry about the bill. I'll pay it all, the brunette said. We have free medicine, Molly replied, rubbing her nose with a paper handkerchief. Still, he smiled with a touch of encouragement. Surely she would need some additional care after the first aid was administered, and something else might be needed here. Here you go. With those words he held out money to her. A lot of money. Molly took it reluctantly. It was for Nancy. Though it was astonishing that suddenly she had such an acquaintance. It was about time, wasn't it? Thank you, he mumbled. How awful. How could he do this to her? Who? Asked the brunette Granson of her. Molly sighed. Surely he must be no one else. Arrived last night. That's how she didn't notice the shadow sliding across the brunette's face. I'll step back for a moment, he said. The swarthy man stepped out onto the hospital porch, walked to the SUV his assistant was waiting for him at the wheel, and briefly informed him that apparently it was time for the private investigator to be replaced. He notified that Charles had taken a ticket to a completely different station, but did not mention that he had gotten in earlier. None of these people knew that Charles had done so, because he was still hesitating at the station, whether to stop at Grand Madinas or to go straight on to the town where, as some acquaintances had suggested, they needed laborers for some construction project. So how would he know that, boss? The aide waved his hands. He doesn't seem to have as many informants as, say, at home. So I guess he's doing his job all right. We're the lucky ones. You were just going to meet Nancy and find out more about Charles and then go after him. I guess you're right, the brunette said. And I think we're really lucky. But you call, tell them to look for him now and better, and have them hold him. Apparently he won't be sitting still anywhere now. You got it, boss. Everything will be done to the best of my ability. The assistant smirked. The brunette went back to the hospital. The doctor had just said that the grandmother was already in the room that she was a little better, and that she could be visited for a while. You're back in time, Molly said. I'm sure she'll want to see you too. Molly's heart sank when she saw Nancy thin under the hospital blanket. Pale, weak, Nancy. Molly forced a smile out of herself and walked over and took the old woman's hand. It's all right now. Are you safe now? How are you feeling? Nothing, I'm fine. I think I'm alive. Nancy replied, tears welling up in her eyes. Oh, Molly, I'm sorry I frightened you. I made you late for work. No, I'm not. It's not your fault, and he's your grandson. Molly gritting his teeth, he'll be held accountable. They'll find him, and they'll find him. And then she noticed the change in Nancy's expression. She was looking over her shoulder as if a demon had appeared to her. Molly felt a chill run down her spine. But when she turned around, all she saw was a brunette who was smiling. A welcoming, hello, Nancy. You old lady was barely breathing. Is that you? I'm glad you remember me after all these years, grinned the brunette, then turned to Molly. We haven't had a chance to get acquainted. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Hector, so I understand. A doctor stopped by the room, but visiting hours are kind of running out. You can still stop by tonight, but in the meantime. Yes, of course, Molly nodded. We all understand. I'll definitely be back, Nancy. Hector took the old lady's hand and kissed it. I am happy to meet you again and be of service to you. I am at your disposal. Molly beckoned to Hector. He was certainly a marvelous one. 
Then they walked out of the room together. That's a man, said a woman in her fifties, a neighbor in the ward. A relative? No, said Nancy, who was shivering slightly. She was wearing a blanket, though, and the room was warm. The family friend did not relent. A curious neighbor. Sounds like a complicated person. A foreigner or something. He had an accent. Shall we introduce him? I winked at the neighbor. I have an unmarried daughter. Good girl, manager, owner. And what the hell should he do on the spot? Exclaimed Nancy and quietly cried. Why did he come? Now the demon. The neighbor was silent, stopped smiling, and felt extremely uncomfortable. And also thought that maybe the appearance of an imposing stranger is deceptive. Molly wasn't a carcass by nature, but somehow, after leaving the hospital, she and Mason had struck up an easy conversation, and he had told her amazing things, that he knew Nancy when she was living in France. I was friends with her grandson Charles, he replied, looking with honest eyes, tinged with a touch of nostalgia. We crossed paths with him a few years ago, but I think such friendships are not worth losing. I've been looking for him, and these are the dire circumstances. Charles seems to have fallen victim to alcohol, and I can't believe he was capable of such atrocities. He invited Molly to a cafe to have a bite to eat after all his worries and spend some time talking before he could visit Nancy again. Molly agreed. It was too late to go back to her job anyway. By the time she got to the village, she would have missed the time to visit Nancy. So the girl just called work, apologized and explained the situation. And then over a cup of coffee, Molly suddenly told Mason so much just laid it all out. And about Nancy and the village, and even about her personal life, right down to her childhood memories. And then she was frightened by her own frankness, not realizing that it had come over her like a charm. But on the other hand, Hector was so charming, so disposed to himself, and so looked into his eyes that it was simply impossible to look away. But he didn't talk much about himself. He only said that he had a business in France inherited from his father, and that he had come here on business, and to see an old friend. And then they went back to the hospital. Only Nancy saw Hector and got so worried that she said she wouldn't talk to him. She wouldn't talk to him. She said she didn't want to talk about time, the past. That life was gone and well it was gone. At that, Nancy kept turning away so as not to meet Hector's eyes. Well, I'm sorry, he sighed so sincerely that Molly wanted to shake Nancy and ask her sternly why she was hurting such a good man. Isn't it clear that he means well? In that case, I can only go away. But you, he smiled at Molly. Kindly take care of her, he said, then handed Molly another wad of money and walked out. How's it going, boss? Asked the assistant as Hector got into the car. The old woman is a tough nut to crack, Hector replied. That your charms don't work on her. Laughter, said the aide. But it happens, boss. So I got a call saying they found Charles. But there's a good chance he's gone. Then let's not waste any time. Hector's face contorted into a predatory grin. Let's go. Molly, sitting down on the chair next to Nancy's bed, gave her the contents of the conversation with the doctor. It turned out that, as if the health of the old woman was not threatened. But the doctor, having learned that Nancy had not visited any polyclinics for a year, strictly said that it was extremely imprudent at her age, and he asked Molly to indoctrinate the patient. Don't worry, Nancy, Molly smiled. It's all right. You'll be discharged soon. You'll be going home soon. And I'll look after you there. You'll live to see it. As for your grandson, we don't have him. Don't do anything to Charles, said Nancy and Molly. He choked on the air, because Nancy suddenly began to say that no, Charles is not guilty of anything. It was the Dan Vodka. But he's a good man. No matter how good he was in the past, maybe when he was a kid, but now he's an adult and has to take responsibility for his actions. Molly shook her head. You can't leave it like that, Nancy. You don't know. A few tears rolled from the old woman's eyes. Oh girl, you don't know it was me Charles ruined. And then now this creature's come for his soul. On his soul, just like his father. Who are you talking about? 
Molly frowned. Nancy, you mustn't worry. Why don't you go back to ancient times and rest now? And then? No. Nancy grabbed Molly's hand again with sudden force, so that it hurt. I've kept it all to myself for years. And now I have to tell you. I'm sorry, my roommate spoke up. But maybe I should move to the far bunk. Just for now. I'll hear everything by accident, because I'm right next to you. No, sighed Nancy. I don't care anymore. They're ready to tell the world the truth. There was no one else in the room but the three of them, and Nancy began her story. She spoke quickly, easily, clearly, and intelligently, as if she were reading a book, pouring out her soul. The facts were stated. She didn't announce herself to others. She just began to tell everything as it was and about her youth, and big, selfish dreams, and about the marriage that ended in tragedy, and about how she didn't save her grandson, entrusting the child into the hands of a monster, and about how she returned home and forgot everything. Until she didn't go out. Wow, said the neighbor on the ward, when Nancy finished her story. Hollywood's on vacation. Are you sure this is the man? The boy in the past? Molly asked. Yes. Nancy nodded. Noah Black had an only son. His name was Hector. And this is him. His eyes. I was beginning to forget my own husband's face, too. But his eyes are all his father's. He went. Molly to Sveta the little old lady looked on with a desperate plea save my grandson. He must not be the first to find him. All right, Molly agreed though she couldn't quite figure out what she should do now. But to refuse Nancy's request, yes, especially when she was in the hospital, even more so. After the whole story she'd heard, she couldn't. All right, I'll do whatever it takes. Molly was on her way back to the village in the late afternoon. Where have you been? She was met on the doorstep by her disgruntled little sister. My father and I are hungry. In general, Molly has already gotten used to the fact that it is her duty to cook for the family. And when I dinner at all to run the house, she did not demand much. They are from my father, not from my sister. And even pitied. She gave birth to Mashenka when she was just a baby. And the age of a difficult teenager. But suddenly the new Molly realized it. They both lost the same mother. She too was orphaned early and as a teenager, had to shoulder so much on her shoulders. And this, and this James, he's a smart kid, goes to school in the city and doesn't beg for money. Grew up to be a man. And your father, he lost his wife, but he still has three kids. And Molly gave Maria a cold, reproachful look since she was 17 girls. And I've never worked a day, but I only have dancing, watching videos on the internet, about the lives of the rich and famous. If you're hungry, make your own dinner. Boil some pasta and fry some cutlets. There's plenty in the freezer. It's a lot of work, she said, and went back to the front door. I've got things to do. Let's look after your father. She's a big girl. It was very strange, but for some reason it all fell out. Molly felt such moral relief. She felt so much better and she hurried over to Grandpa Jacob's house. Because if there was one person who could be trusted with the whole story of Nancy, from whom one could truly ask for help, it was Grandpa Jacob. Charles, on leaving the village, was in feelings of the most confused kind. He wanted more than anything to be lost somewhere in the surrounding woods and fields, like a wild beast, and not to be found. To the realization of what he had done to his own grandmother, was now added a burning fear. A man from his past, Hector, why did he come? Certainly not to reminisce about the good old days. Charles didn't know what was going on yet, but on some deep instinctive level, he sensed that this man was a threat to him, on foot, at a brisk pace, so that his heart almost jumped out of his chest. Charles reached the station, and there he suddenly began to feel that he was being watched, that everywhere, there were eyes and ears that served his enemy. Hector, fighting the urge to just throw himself screaming wherever he wanted to go. Charles began to slowly step aside. He suddenly thought that the best thing for him to do was to go back to Zorka and have his men capture him. 
have him subdued for all he had done, and then just have them take him to Nancy, and he would apologize to her for everything. That's definitely the way to do it. That's the only thing to do. But no sooner had Charles stepped out of the station of the hamlet neighboring the ferrets than he suddenly ran into someone. And then everything happened very quickly. Quiet, if you don't want trouble, said a sturdy ball tight to him, taking him under the arm in a seemingly polite but tenacious manner. Follow me and be quiet. Just a few more moments. Charles didn't even realize how it had happened, but he was like in a daze. He didn't scream. He didn't call for help. He was just in shock because he realized that he was being led to the gut of the SUV in which Hector was sitting. But hello, said his like a childhood friend who was also sitting in the back seat. The bald type sat forward. Charles opened his mouth and for some reason could not make a sound. Then he swallowed hard. What do you want? He asked, barely audible. Which one? Good question. Hector grinned. Yeah, sort of. I guess we never would have seen each other if it hadn't been for certain circumstances. You know, I was happy for you when everything happened and my father was arrested. You know, I always felt especially sorry for you. Charles could not stop staring into Hector's eyes like a hypnotist as he spoke, and he realized that he was not lying. The car started and drove off. Hector, meanwhile, went on. He said that, yes, he didn't share his father's beliefs, but he was an authoritative parental figure. What could a child do against her? Hector said he was very relieved when it was over. After all, neither he nor the other kids had to be subjected to nightmarish mind control experiments anymore. Do you want to know why he did that? Hector asked. And although Charles shook his head negatively, hysterically, he still said, he said that his father believed that through special techniques of influence on the psyche can be raised a kind of future special forces, which will obey once laid in them programs. True, at the stage when Charles was involved in this creepy and supposedly scientific experiment, the children were simply suppressed, without having any programs put into them yet. I see. Hector smiled sympathetically. I had nightmares myself for a long time. My father got what he deserved. I was taken care of, and I got my inheritance in due time. Except, you know, he owned one thing, and it was very important, not only to him, but to his ancestors. It was supposed to be inherited by me, but it was missing. No one knew where it went. Our estate. There are too many difficult memories associated with it. Hector continued without haste. But although no one lives there, it is guarded. But unfortunately, the security system was breached, and the cameras detected an intruder entering the house. This person just started walking around the garden for some reason. Curious, isn't it? And then he seemed to take something, something, from an old oak tree. Unfortunately, it wasn't clear from the video what it took, but my people were able to find out what the man was, and I immediately guessed what he might have taken. The car slowed down, while they had been talking, it had left the station, driven around the village, and was now standing on the river bank, almost at the edge of the cliff. Hector moved closer, looking at Charles very intently. And then I thought what a strange coincidence, and I decided that we should meet. Charles was breathing heavily. He was feeling so bad right now. And then he started talking and told me everything he was thinking and feeling. He remembered how at first he truly thought of Hector as his friend. And then he couldn't understand how he continued to love him in spite of everything his father had done. I wish we had never met again, Charles said. You'll never see me again, Hector grinned. Just give me what's mine. Why do you even want that ring? I don't know, Charles answered honestly. I was a kid then. And I don't know, I wanted some kind of revenge. And then I thought that if I took it, it would make it easier to accept the past. And how did it get easier? Hector asked curtly. No, Charles replied. So you want the ring? In a matter of moments, Charles suddenly jumped out of the car, ran up to the cliff. He stretched out his hand, and on his open palm a silver ring glinted dimly in the setting sun. If you knew how much I hate you. He spat out anger with a bitter, marching resentment from childhood. How can you, 
After all he has done to us, live like this. I see the master of life is not poor. It's all right. I don't have nightmares. How many kids have their lives ruined? Have you ever thought about it? It wasn't my problem. Hector reconciled himself. He was getting closer. As if the unspoken but explicit threat to throw the ring into the river didn't bother him at all. The victims and their families have been generously compensated from my father's estate. Your grandmother, by the way, was offered one. But she declined. What was I supposed to do? Give up the family business, suffer for the rest of my life. Yes, my father was wrong, Hector sighed. But my life goes on, and I have no intention of letting anyone interfere with my plans. Give it back, Charles. And why would I do that? Tears rolled down the man's face. You think you can buy me? Money doesn't interest you, Hector said. But I must let you in on a little secret. My father taught me something. There's a special gift passed down through the male line in our family. It would be primitive to call it hypnosis, but to make it easier for someone like you to understand, let's call it this. Give me the ring and then I'll help you. You'll make me forget everything. And no, you will. You'll remember a lot of things, but you'll be able to let it go and you'll be able to get on with your life. I was also told that you were coded and you started drinking. You know, once you're off it, you can't stop. You're gonna drink more and more until the end. But if you give up what's mine, I'll help you. Charles was breathing hard. He didn't know what to do. On the one hand, he was tempted to show his pride because he wanted to spite him. But on the other, Charles suddenly looked at all this as if from the outside. They were kids back then, and maybe if he had been in a similar situation himself, then no matter how much of a monster his father was, he wouldn't have been able to disown him completely. Yes, it was wrong all right. But Charles remembered himself how much he hated Nancy's grandmother and made up his mind the ring glinted in the setting sun and disappeared into the palm of Hector's hand and then went to his finger on his left hand. Say nothing more and look me in the eye, Hector said, and placing his palms on Charles's shoulders, stood directly in front of him. And then he spoke. He spoke in several languages, including Latin. And the words were like whipping blows, penetrating Charles's consciousness. Molly and Grandpa Jacob went through all the options. They managed to drive Jacob's son-in-law's car to the train station. The lady at the cafeteria told them that she had seen a man who looked like Charles, but that he had left in an expensive car. No, it can't be. Molly was shocked. What can you do? Jacob said, maybe Nancy is exaggerating. Maybe Hector doesn't want to hurt Charles. Why would he? All right, Molly, you can do it. You can go and look all night long. I'm getting old, I'm going home. Yes, perhaps sleep is the best idea, sighed Molly, who had a terrible headache from the worries of the day. So she and Jacob set off back to the village. Molly did not yet know that on their return, they would find Nancy Charles in the house who had become a very different person, who had let go of the burden of the past and was ready to start a new life. And also to take care, like a good grandson takes care of his grandmother. Little did she know that by the time they all did, she, Charles and Nancy would have a thorough talk about everything. Hector and his assistant would already be back in France. Molly could not know in advance that her brother would return from the city on vacation from vocational school not alone but with his good friend, an ordinary and very good guy named Volodia, who would become for Molly first just a kind acquaintance and then a caring husband. And that with his support, she will manage to gradually cure her father, as well as reeducate her sister, who will eventually enter the veterinarian and decide to devote her life to caring for animals. Molly did not suspect that in a few years, a tourist company will come to Zorka village and open a hotel here. Tourists will come here, and the area would become much more prosperous, and Charles would end up working here as a tour guide and eventually marry the shop girl. But all that was just ahead. In the meantime, the cockerels sang their evening song over the village and the sunset. The first stars spilled out into the sky, and the moon emerged from behind the clouds with its silvery side and dived back into their ghostly downy railing. 
created a sparkling path on the river.